Toronto is an incredibly fertile place to be doing a machine learning startup um, these days. I've deliberately created a, a title that would be provocative to get you uh, immediately resisting the force of my argument as I'm about to make it. I'm a law professor, this is what I do. Um, and I feel some insecurity up here as a law professor and as a CEO of a legal tech startup addressing a room full of tech nerds. Um, so you're thinking a law professor, what's a law professor know about machine learning or any of this stuff? And look, he's already starting off with this horribly uh, exaggerated title, Toronto Machine Learning Startup Capital of the World. And you're probably thinking about something like this. How can, how can Toronto be the machine learning startup capital of the world? Um, well, this is what I think of, and I don't think it's a contest. It's not meant to be a contest. We can have a multipolar world. We can have multiple capitals. Toronto's the capital of Ontario. Ottawa's the capital of Canada. Jason is telling me to put the mic near my mouth so everyone can hear me. And, um, and Toronto's a fantastic place to be doing a startup. And why not? Why can't Toronto be the tech startup of the world or a tech startup of the world? I think there are many, many reasons why Toronto is exceptionally well located to do this. It's the most diverse city in the world. Um, I have members of my team um, from Nigeria, from Australia, from South Africa. It's amazing the pool of talent that we can access here in Toronto. Uh, we have phenomenally good universities. This is a picture of the University of Toronto. Of course, the University of Waterloo. I don't have pictures of every university, but I would include, of course, Queens and Western and UBC and McGill and Montreal. And at these universities, we've had really amazing innovation. So this is a, an image of Jeff Hinton, um, considered by many to be uh, you know, the, the father of deep learning. Uh, he still retains a, a part-time appointment at the University of Toronto, so we're colleagues, and he's also uh, at Google, of course. And Toronto's in, uh, you know, a fantastic geographical area, proximate to, you know, all of the big cities on the East Coast, and itself a huge city on the East Coast. Toronto recently surpassed Chicago as the fourth biggest city uh, in North America. Okay. So, yeah, 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 Ben, so Toronto's a, a fantastic place. It's big, diverse, lots of talent, lots of research, lots of opportunity. But how do you actually foment, encourage, um, generate these machine learning startups? And then the answer is, uh, you know, trite, oh, ambition and action. Okay, ambition and action, that's, that's cool. That sounds like what you learn about in kindergarten or maybe first grade. You, you need to be ambitious, you need to go out there and do things, but there are tons of supports in the city of Toronto. You're all here tonight because you know about the supports, you know, events like these meetups, TechTO. Um, when I was starting Blue Jay Legal, my, one of my first ports of call was to, to hunt down this man, Daniel DeBow, and say, hey Daniel, I don't know anything about a startup. I know that machine learning is gonna transform law. Teaching 100 students a year at tax law at the University of Toronto is awesome, but 99% of them immediately start forgetting tax law the moment they end uh, typing their final exam. I think maybe we should start training a computer, uh, you know, an expert system using machine learning to really understand the law. That way it's a common resource for everyone to use to access that intelligence and that knowledge. And Daniel said, okay, Ben, step one, you have to read this book. <laughs> I said, okay, uh, that's great. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Stephen Blank, The Four Steps to the Epiphany. But I read it. I found it. I hunted it down. I couldn't get it on Audible, which my, was my favorite format. I had to get it on Kindle. I uh, got it on Kindle, read it. Um, you know, an amazing suggestion. And then uh, Blue Jay Legal joined the Creative Destruction Lab, an ama another amazing resource. Uh, available to us, available to anyone in the city who wants to bring their startup, get some great mentorship, access to capital, advice, highly recommended. You can uh, apply, I think, up until next Monday if you have a startup and you're interested in joining the community. Uh, the next founders, the next 36, another amazing resource. You, all of these supports are here. There are startups. There are dozens and dozens of startups every year, and there are lots of really great resources that you can tap into in the city. 
of course, 111, uh, another great resource. We just moved there uh, last week, the week before last, and I saw Nora here earlier. Hi, Nora, wherever you are. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so if I have one message, and you know, I have 12 seconds left, so my timing is impeccable, um, keep calm and build your dream. There, it, it's very, very uh, much the case that Toronto is a fantastic place to start a startup, even, uh, you know, I think I can back up my claim that Toronto is one of uh, the startup, uh, machine learning startup capitals of the world. Thank you. Questions? Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, really fast question. Didn't IBM created Watson to be more towards law recently? Sorry, your question was whether IBM uh, is making Watson dumber? No, th oh. uh, they made Watson to work with law. So a lot of companies are investing towards that. What is the difference between you, your product and Watson? So, okay, so I, yeah, this, this is a great, I did not plant this question. This is a great opportunity to talk about what Blue Jay Legal actually does, right? So Blue Jay Legal uses uh, artificial intelligence, including Watson uh, and other machine learning technologies to identify uh, how courts would decide new fact situations if they were to confront them in gray areas of the law. So a great example is, you know, this question of worker classification, is a worker an employee or an independent contractor? Um, we've essentially digitally remastered that entire legal question, drawing on hundreds and hundreds of court cases, and now with 21 questions, can get, you know, close to 98% accuracy on how a court would characterize those workers for tax purposes. And we are using uh, some of the Watson APIs in our solution, as well as some other um, proprietary machine learning techniques. Hey, uh, so legal codes are a moving target. How, does, how is any AI gonna keep up with changing legislature and legal codes? Right, so this is, this is a great question. So the law is constantly changing. How does, how does this keep up? Um, we're really focusing on those areas that are based on the common law, where the law is actually relatively stable, but it's multi-criterial. So it's, it's depending on many, many different dimensions of best fit, and it's really difficult for humans to figure out how judges implicitly are gonna weight many different uh, criteria all at once and then make a call. Uh, and so we're really focusing on those areas where machine learning algorithms have a distinct advantage over humans, which is they can read, functionally read every single judgment in a gray area and come up with really confident predictions about how a court would answer a novel case. Um, in other areas where things are more um, black and white, more logic based, um, you know, there are alternative uh, approaches to that and building a conventional expert system works well there if you have really clear rules that you can apply. And then it's just a, it's a matter of elbow grease, right? And just working through and updating the system to reflect changes to the statute. Last question, um, so make it count. I, all right, uh, have you faced uh, resistance from, from, law com from uh, firms and professionals in the field or have you, have you felt that there's a lot, been a lot of support uh, for, your, for your product? Okay, so this is a great question. So how much support have we had from tax accountants and tax lawyers? This is a great question because it allows me to plug PwC. So PwC uh, was one of, the, one of the investors in our uh, seed round. Uh, we raised $1.2 million um, late last year. Uh, PwC saw the potential. Um, we're now working with three of the big four uh, accounting firms, including PwC as well as some really large law firms, so Oslers, Blake's, Steichman Elliott, Thorstensons. Uh, and so I think, I think the legal community and you know, the accounting firms are really coming around to the idea that disruption is imminent. This is happening. Um, and uh, the work by you know, certain authors like Richard Susskind has been really formative in getting, getting the word out that this disruption is happening. Um, it's out there. And, and I've written about 
where I think the law goes, the path of the law, um, something that I, I call the legal singularity, um, and two of my co-founders have, have written uh, something called Law in the Future. So you can find those things on SSRN by Googling, uh, Blue Jay Legal, Legal Singularity, those sorts of things. You can find the papers and, and get our considered thoughts on the matter. And I think everyone's supportive and, and sees that this is happening and everyone wants to get ahead of it. One last non question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, you know what, I'm excited to hear about machine learning and law now uh, working together. That's amazing. But when you start to talk about judging and machine learning, that scares the shit out of me. Oh. <laughs> Can, is, so is this a comment or a question? It's, it's a bit of a question. <laughs> I'm wondering why, so I would like you to talk a little bit more about how this might work because the thing about judging, at least from what I've seen, a lot of television, but, but what I've seen is that people are discussing, there's a bit of emotion and, and a, an opinion as well as a ton of facts at the end of the day. So where does machine learning come in with that? Oh gosh, so, so I could really, I, you know, I could talk for a very long time about this question. I could talk about how um, the whole idea of machine learning and judging scares my colleagues at the law school, where this is, this is about legal theory and how judges actually decide, and it's a contest between the legal realists who say judges just kind of make decisions on the basis of their preferences, and then legal formalists who say, no, 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 judges are following um, the law and they're, they're positivists, so they're, they're kind of filling in the gaps in the law. I think what we're seeing using machine learning and uh, uncovering the law is that there's something else going on entirely in judging, and it's, it's, it's a shot across the bow what we're doing for theories of judging and theories of judicial decision making. I, can, I would love to fill you in and tell you all about it, but I, I think one point is just that it's amazing that our system is able to predict with such a high degree of accuracy how judges would decide new factual circumstances. Um, and we're, we're basing that on um, partitioning the data and training our models on 70% of the data and then holding 30% in reserve and evaluating how the models are actually addressing that other 30%. And it's really, really accurate. So it's So the judges are doing something consistent and internally uh, reliable. I think one caution, and, and maybe this goes to your fear about uh, having judges using machine learning to help decide, is it's as if they've been dancing in the dark. In these gray areas of the law, they've been dancing in the dark because they, they decide. Um, and you know there is appellate review for most of these judgments, but um, it hasn't really been as visible to users about you know the basis of the, the judgments and how well it fits in with the existing case law. Now they've been dancing in the dark and somebody just turned on the lights. And now it makes, it makes the judges feel perhaps a little bit um, exposed. Uh, and so I think your fear is, is you know, intuitively well placed. And, and I think it's something that we're in the legal community gonna have to come to terms with. Thanks.